Chair, we are now live on YouTube. William, can you please confirm that we are now streaming live? Thank you, William. I'd like to welcome members, officers and registered speakers to this planning control committee. Please note the meeting is being streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel. Before the meeting starts, I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer to explain how proceedings will work. Thank you, William. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the rules of debate, if a member wishes to speak, they should use the speak button located on their microphone unit. Your microphone will light up green and the chair will be alerted of your request to speak. When the chair invites you to speak, your microphone will be made live and will turn red, at which point you can speak. Please can I remind you that the normal procedure rules in respect of debate and times to speak will apply. On voting, when requested to vote, voting will be via the yes, no, abstain buttons on your microphone unit. Details of how members voted will be shown on the screens around the room and the results will be visible on the YouTube stream. In the event of a tied vote, the chair will have the casting vote. On COVID social distancing, members and officers are required to wear masks when standing or moving around the room or the building and masks can be removed whilst seated. Exit and entry to the room and the building will be guided by marshals. Are there any questions before we start the meeting? Thank you. Um, I also need to take a brief roll call to check that um, our planning officer, Sam DeCoco, who is joining us online, can hear us. Sam? Can I you just can hear if you can hear me. Thank you very much. Um, I will now hand back to the chair. Apologies for absence. Apologies have been received from councillors Ruth Brown, Val Bryan, Mike Hewson and Ian Moody. Having given due notice, Councillor Ian Mantle has advised he will be substituting for Councillor Val Bryant and Councillor Michael Muir has advised he will be substituting for Ian Moody. Are there any other apologies, please? No. Okay, minutes of the 27th of May. I, prefer, propose, oops, I propose we take as read and approve as a true record the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 27th of May. 2021. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Are there any comments on the minutes? No. Can we go to the vote then, please? Members, if you could vote now. Thank you, Chair, that vote is carried. Notification of other business. There is no other business to be taken at this meeting. Chair's announcements, audio recording. In accordance with the council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording via the NHDC YouTube channel. Declarations of interest. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. To clarify matters for the registered speakers, members of the public have five minutes for each group of speakers and five minutes for objectors and five minutes for supporters. The five minute time limit also applies to member advocates. Um, and I've allowed 10 minutes speaking time for the Norton Action Group. Can I clarify the 10 minute allocation has been for all registered speakers on that item? Okay, thank you. A bell will sound at four and a half minutes to alert you that you have 30 seconds left. At five minutes, a bell will sound again to signify the speaker must cease. Please note, for item six, I have increased the speaking time to 10 minutes per group. 
10 minutes for objectors and 10 minutes for supporters. This 10 minute time limit also applies to member advocates. Change to the agenda. Item eight on your agendas, 20 forward slash 01764 forward slash FP, the bell in 65 High Street, Codicott, will not be taken tonight due to additional consultations being required before presentation. Public participation. Are there six registered speakers in attendance, please? Yeah, thank you. So we'll go to the first item. Number six on your agenda, 19 forward slash 00520 forward slash OP. Land between Croft Lane, Norton Road, and Cashio Lane, Letchworth Garden City, Hertfordshire. Outline planning application for residential development of up to 42 dwellings, all matters reserved, but access as amended by plans and information received on the 9th of June 2020, 23rd of July 2020, and the 10th of December 2020. The officer to present is Sam DeCoco. Thank you, Chair. So there are some preliminary matters to go through on this particular application before we get going with the presentation. Um, members have been sent late representations, which have been received uh, post recommendation and pre committee. In addition, members have been sent a summary neighbour presentation from uh, Norton Action Group alongside a covering email from that same group. The late representations that have been received, uh, that have been sent to members, do not add any additional concerns to those already raised and referred to within my officer report. In respect to the late representation from Norton Action Group, I will add to my report that no written comments have been received or are required from the conservation officer in this instance. The case officer and delegated officer are sufficiently qualified to assess the harm to the heritage asset resultant from this proposed development. And in any case, informal consultation through meetings have been held with the conservation officer whose view accords with the view expressed within my officer report. Uh, in addition, referring again to the Norton Action Group representation, Hertfordshire Ecology have responded to consultation twice in respect to this application with no objections subject to informatives. Um, I will address any other concerns members may wish me to address following presentations and debate on this item in conjunction with and referral to Mark Youngman from Hertfordshire Highways, who is here to answer any questions. Members will be aware uh, of this site from committee dated 27th of May 2021, whereby members deferred the decision so that Hertfordshire Highways could provide a representative to answer questions in respect to the safe use of the highways. As I've said, uh, Mark Youngman is here today and will field any highways oriented questions that members may have about this particular site. If we could start the presentation, please. Councillor Mew. Thank you, Chair, um, for recognising me. Uh, I have to declare an interest on this item as I'm a county councillor, but at county level, I've taken no part in any decisions or any discussions on this application. I have spoken to our planning lawyer, and she says I can um, uh, enter the debate and vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beale. Daryl, do we have the presentation available?
Thank you, Daryl. Could we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, next slide. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, site as can be seen on the screen here. Um, you will see the horizontal green lines to the north of the screen uh, or to the top of the screen representing Croft Lane Conservation Area. The section of the site which projects onto Croft Lane from where the field ends contains two ancillary outbuildings and is within the conservation area. The rest of the site falls outside of the conservation area. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So I will go through the site photographs again, as we did last time. Uh, members will see a arrow in the bottom right hand of the screen to show where the photograph has been taken from. Uh, so this is the entrance to Croft Lane from Norton Road, as indicated by the arrow. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the location of a proposed raised pedestrian crossing over Croft Lane to get onto Greenway, a uh, popular walking and cyclist route. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have uh, Croft Lane as indicated by the arrow. Uh, as can be seen, there are no footpaths. Next slide, please. Um, here we are a little bit further down and you can see the proposed entrance to the site and the part of the site which fronts onto Croft Lane within the conservation area with the hedge and three trees lining the entrance. Next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, the listed farmhouse, which is immediately to the east of the part of the site which is going to provide the vehicular access for the dwellings. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have uh, the access point with the three trees, uh, the smaller one in the middle proposed to be removed to provide the vehicular access. And in the background, you can see another listed building which sits to the west of the access. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a central position looking through the uh, section of the site within the conservation area to the location of the proposed dwellings. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a tree on the opposite side of Croft Lane to the proposed access, uh, whereby some additional road will be required next to the tree to provide the sweat paths required for large vehicular access. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have a close up of that central tree in the row of three showing its current condition, which is poor. Next slide, please. Uh, here we are looking from the west towards the access to the site, again showing the three trees which line the front of the site. Next slide, please. OK, here we have some of the existing curb detail, which will be aimed to be reflected at the entrance to the site and within the site itself uh, to provide some historic character to the access. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the part of Croft Lane, which actually has a footpath and some trees lining it alongside a green verge. Next slide, please. And here we have an example of a section of the path where between the trees, the footpath could be widened to two meters in width. Next slide, please. Uh, again, another example of a section of the path that could be widened without having a harmful impact on uh, trees and landscape. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is the junction of Croft Lane and Cascio Lane where a raised table will be provided aimed at uh, slowing and calming vehicular movements to provide a safe shared surface for crossing. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, here we have the uh, Casio Lane access point uh, with trees either side, and you can see the uh, the houses and the vehicular driveway access to the adjoining houses just in the bottom right hand corner there. Next slide, please. OK, so we are now within the site looking outwards, uh, within the conservation area, looking towards the three trees that line the front of the site. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have uh, looking from the entrance to the site towards where the new dwellings will be. Uh, you can see the building to the left there. We'll see a bit closer in closer detail is um, a not unsignificant building within the conservation area, and it is proposed to be retained as a part of the development. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have the smaller outbuilding, which is of much lesser significance. Again, isn't proposed to be removed at the moment, but I wouldn't have significant concerns if it was in the future. Next slide, please. And that's a closer up detail of the larger outbuilding or building within the conservation area on the site, uh, which I think would be best served to be retained as a reminder of the history of the site itself but that's a matter for later reserved matters. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have the, that, that sliver entrance to the site within the conservation area from within the site itself. Next slide, please. So all, all of these slides are just showing some of the trees and the boundary within the site itself. Um, as can be shown here, you cannot perceive from within the site many dwellings from this particular perspective. Next slide, please. Again, here we're looking back onto uh, Croft Lane from within the site, and as can be seen, the uh, views in and out of the site from this particular pers uh, perspective is softened by the landscape. Next slide, please. OK, here we're looking onto the corner of Croft Lane and Norton Road. Again, mature landscape at the boundary of the site. Next slide, please. So here we've moved on to look onto the rear of properties on Norton Road, whereby the landscaping along the boundary of the site is um, much well, less mature, let's say. Next slide, please. Uh, again, looking back onto uh, Norton Road from within the site and more sparse uh, boundary landscape. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, another perspective onto Norton Road, and then you can see the rear of the dwellings there. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the Casio Lane uh, access point um, from within the site itself. Next slide, please. And this is just a bit closer, showing the trees either side of the uh, of the access point and the width of the access itself. Next slide, please. Here we're looking onto the back of properties on Croft Lane and the back of the conservation area again. And as can be seen, uh, the dwellings are screened well by this mature landscaping. Next slide, please. And here we are looking on to uh, Casio Lane, a, a bit less of the soft landscape in here at the boundary of the properties. Next slide, please. And here we're just back at the uh, eastern edge of the site, looking on to the wider site uh, through a wider lens. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're on to the site itself. Uh, this is the site location plan. Next slide, please. It, here we have the key drawing. This is the proposed access details, the only unreserved matter in this application. Uh, as can be seen, it runs through the center of those three trees, proposing to remove the central tree of that line, uh, which I showed the condition of in an earlier drawing is very much a U classified tree uh, coming towards the end of its life and constrained by the other trees. 
Um, it shows the access as negotiated to be further from the listed building to the east uh, in order to provide more relief to that uh, particular or a junction there would be considered uh, slightly worse for the conservation area than here. And we've also negotiated out a raised table to provide a change in surface material to denote more softly the transition from a vehicular road to a shared surface. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we have both of the access points. So we've got the vehicular access to the top of the this particular drawing. And we've also got the pedestrian and cyclist access onto Cascio Lane and a proposed crossing on Cascio Lane to get to the footpath, which is on the other side, uh, on the south side, I guess, from, from this particular aspect uh, of Cascio Lane. Um, you can also see towards the left-hand side of the image, the indicated two metre wide footpath along Croft Lane, where it is appropriate to do so. Next slide, please. Okay, so this shows the uh, swept path analysis for the proposed access, showing that larger vehicles are required to serve the development will be able to safely access and egress the site. Next slide, please. Okay, here we have the, uh, the landscape survey showing the quality of the trees and the trees distribution. Next slide, please. And here as previously presented is the mood board for the detailing of the access which is reserved by condition to make sure that the access detailing is uh, appropriate to the context. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the indicative layout, uh, notwithstanding the access, which is a, uh, a previous version of the access, but it doesn't change the indicative layout. As can be seen, it's a circular layout with the main access road and then a shared surface around the dwellings there. Um, the dwellings have been spaced from the rear of properties on Norton Road, as can be seen from the, uh, the site photos. Uh, it's considered that that's a good design detail to ensure a greater privacy is provided for those properties because the landscape boundary is more sparse. Um, this is an indicative layout only, and I have made suggestions in respect to the proximity of built form to the rear of properties on Cascio Lane as well within my report, but that will be secured at later stage within a reserved matters application. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the final slide, and uh, ideally this could be left up for a little while. This is the additional information that's been submitted since the deferral at the last committee. So this slide shows various, act uh, various access options that have been provided and assessed. Uh, I must at this point state that this particular drawing and this information is required to satisfy the policy requirement that the access details minimize harm to the conservation area. These access options have not been provided for any other reason and would not be required unless there is that minor policy requirement within the allocation to ensure that the access details minimize harm to the conservation area. This hasn't changed or affected anything within my previous recommendation or the officer report. It's just visually confirms my opinion that the alternative access options are either not feasible because they require um, private land or the, the use of private land or the altering of private accesses that already exist, um, or they are more harmful to the conservation area than the proposed access. When I refer to the more harmful I am referring to the one-way option, which I requested to be discussed within the negotiation of this particular proposal. 
and can be seen at the top centrally in terms of its impact on Croft Lane. This access would require a significant amount of bollards to stop um, vehicle movements in the wrong direction, as well as 24 hour illuminated signage. Um, I feel that this visual clutter would cause greater harm to the significance of the conservation area than the access proposed to be determined within this application. I believe that is the end of my presentation. If we go to the next slide. Thank you, Chair. I pass back to you. Thank you. Can I ask members if they have any questions for the officer, please? No, okay. Oh, sorry, Councillor Levitt. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Sam. Um, just to you put quite a lot of emphasis there on the uh, requirement to minimise the impact on the conservation area of the of the access route. Does that at any time take precedent over other uh, highways policies? So uh, thank you, Councillor Levitt. It's a balancing exercise, as with uh, a lot of planning policies, sometimes uh, the policy requirements pull in opposing directions. Um, in this case, we have to balance the, one, the policy requirement, uh, two, the level of harm that we're looking at, which I consider to be at the very lower end of less than substantial. And then we've also got to balance against that the necessity to actually provide some form of access that is technically acceptable to a highway standard in order to actually provide these what I consider quite significant benefits of affordable housing and a decent mix of market housing in a, a context of a significant requirement within North Hertfordshire. So yes, it is a balance. We do have to balance all of the requirements. And I feel that this proposed access does balance them. Thank you. If I don't have any other questions, we'll move now to our registered speakers. I'd like to invite um, Kevin Hinton sharing with Nathan Hanks to speak first. Thank you. So to remind you, you have 10 minutes speaking time between you. Okay. It's Kevin Hinton. So if you hit the button, this one. Uh, yeah. My name's Kevin Hinton, 37 years resident of Croft Lane. I'm here representing Norton Action Group. The planning officer has stated, Croft Lane is the only access that is practical in all three briefs to the committee. <clears throat> At the public consultation, Vincent Corbyn stated that the access onto Croft Lane is the Achilles heel of the application. I and others would confirm that under oath. Quote the planning officer, the setting of the conservation area by reasons of the lane's confined nature has limited contribution to the significance of the heritage asset. End of quote. Highways state that re-engineering the lane to modern standards and in keeping with the conservation area is not possible. Quote from the NHSC Conservation Area Character Statement. The special interest in Croft Lane lies in its connection to the foundation of Lecture's Garden City. And it's having within it a series of significant buildings by key Letchworth Garden City architects, end quote. The planning officer states that the listed buildings have no sight lines to them. In fact, seven can be clearly seen from the lane. The three gables adjacent to the entrance was Hignett's home. He designed the Spirella building, Prince Charles's favorite. Thus, this lane is significant in conservation area context. 
is the planning officer's dismissal of the conservation area and that no substantial harm accrues, one of convenience to ensure the success of this application. The lane is 3.8 metres wide at its narrowest, with no footpaths for 220 metres from the access towards Norton Road. Vehicles cannot pass each other. Pedestrians and vehicles share surfaces. This access, according to the traffic assessment, will increase vehicle movements by 350% from 8am to 9am, precisely when families are walking their children to school. The TA does not mention the extra children and adults who will utilise the shared surfaces from the 145 bedrooms on the development. Or that the proposed pedestrian crossing on Norton Road will attract more pedestrians on the lane. Why did Highways not insist that the lane is widened with footpaths, just like it did of the access? The Information Commissioner's Office has confirmed that our request for unredaction of key documents has merit, and they've instructed HCC accordingly. We still await receipt. What is being hidden? The proposed use of Croft Lane to access this development will detract from a historic lane that we are proud to live in, harm the setting of the heritage buildings, leading to a loss of trees, wildlife, and prejudice our living conditions with a harmful impact on the environment. It will also result in the loss of safety to our families, walkers, cyclists, and other users of Croft Lane. This means children walking or cycling to school or walkers to Norton or the Greenway will have additional vehicles to contend with on a lane that is not designed for heavy traffic, thus contravening MPPF sections with added children and car movements from the development. It also contravenes Hearts Highways Design Guide. What risk and damage will additionally occur during construction? I therefore urge you, to protect our basic amenities and safety and refuse the application. Thank you. Uh, members, I believe, shared our concerns at the last committee meeting regarding highway safety matters and agreed that the lack of footway on Croft Lane was a key issue and had not been dealt with or even commented on by Hertfordshire Highways. Hertfordshire Highways has provided no response to those concerns since the last committee. And while Vincent Gorbing, the scheme architects, have provided additional information, their report is flawed, misleading, and does nothing to answer the key issue, i.e. why is a substandard highway arrangement being recommended for approval? The applicant has provided and relies upon a sort of road safety audit. However, a road safety audit, as de de defined by the Design Manual for Roads and Bridges, only deals with proposed highway works. It does not consider, for example, pedestrian safety along a section of road where no highway works are proposed such as the section of Croft Lane with no footway. Separate audits would be required in order to assess that matter, ideally an audit known as a pedestrian environment review system. I suspect that the highway officer who's here today may tell you they consider Croft Lane is adequate without a footway as it has low traffic flows and has operated safely in the past. That does not, however, mean that it can be considered safe when vehicular and pedestrian traffic flows will increase significantly as a result of this development. As a reminder, the proposals will increase peak hour traffic on Croft Lane by a factor of three to four times. While there is a secondary, potentially safe pedestrian route from the site to the nearest school via Gashio Lane and Norton Road, Croft Lane is already utilised as a route to school and will be utilised by the majority of new residents, as the route to school via Gashio Lane is one and a half times the distance measured from the centre of the site. At the previous committee meeting, members raised concern that at the potential cost implications for NHTC in the event that they refuse the application on highways grounds and the applicant subsequently submits an appeal. I'm therefore offering here on record to act as expert witness on highways grounds in support of any decision you make to refuse the application and I will do so at no cost to NHTC. I have 15 years of experience acting as an expert highways witness at planning appeals and inquiries and I'm confident that I can defend a highways based, highway safety based reason for refusal. I've also issued to members via a letter earlier this week an offer for the same. 
While every application must be considered on its merits, there are some matters that without exception are considered to be unacceptable in association with new developments of this scale in Hertfordshire. Our research and my many years of working on developments in Hertfordshire tell me that a significant intensification of use of a road that is substandard in width and has no fitway is one such matter. This is the only exception to that rule that I've been able to find, having reviewed many comparable schemes. Members are, I understand, told that they should not consider precedent as being material in both in terms of what has been accepted or rejected on other applications. However, even if that is the case in this forum, there, where we were we to end up at an appeal, precedent is very much a consideration in that forum and is in fact key in providing evidence as to acceptability, safety and development impact. This application until recently provided a, a significant benefit to highway safety in the vicinity of the site through a proposed new crossing on Norton Road. However, residents have now been advised by Hertfordshire County Council that the crossing is to be provided through alternate funding, regardless of the outcome of this application. This tips the balance in terms of benefits versus negatives of this application very much further toward the negative. My final request to members is that you have not, if you are not absolutely certain that these proposals will provide safe and suitable access for all, you should refuse the application. If the applicant is truly confident they are providing safe access, they can appeal and a planning inspector will make a decision based upon detailed evidence, evidence that I will provide on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you both. Can I ask the members if they have any questions for our registered speakers, please? Councillor Ian Mantle. Thank you. Um, could I be clear, what you're suggesting is that the section from the proposed new access to the end of uh, Croft Lane should be upgraded to be the equivalent of a normal uh, access road to a development, basically changing the character of it completely. Am I understanding you correctly? What I'm saying is that Hertfordshire County Council's guidance requires that any development over 25 houses has uh, separate footways and roads, and that therefore without that on Croft Lane, this development is unacceptable. I'm not saying it should be done, I'm saying it's unacceptable. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? No. Okay, can I ask? Okay, can I ask members if they have any questions for our highways officer who's attending tonight, Mark Youngman. Councillor David Levitt. Thank you, Chair, and good evening. Uh, question for you. Um, was the requirement to minimise the impact on the conservation area a fact in compromising the requirements of LT4 and a highway and um, highways design manuals to provide some form of access that is technically acceptable, quoting the officer, uh, a factor in that decision. Thank you. Can I invite Mark Youngman to respond? Yeah, I'm waiting for it to go red. It is now. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Thank you for the question. Um, so the we have to consider many factors when, when looking at applications. And this application originally came in uh, several years ago now. And originally uh, we, you know, we didn't give a positive response, but we've worked with the developer to uh, take into consideration many factors, inclu including uh, that one of the access points is off a conservation area and, and try and come up with a, a set of mitigation measures that would be acceptable in a conservation area. So for example, the officer mentioned that the most recent change was that we uh, um, allowed for the speed table at the entrance to be omitted. And that's why we've ended up with considering over time at least uh, eight different options. Thank you for that. Uh, so as a follow up to that, 
if this application had not been in a conservation area, would that access layout as it stands now have been acceptable to yourselves as highways officers? If that consideration about the uh, conservation area came into it? I think we would have been, if, if that wasn't a factor, the conservation area, then we would have felt um, that it was reasonable, uh, you know, the meetings, the planning tests, reasonable and in scale to uh, negotiate more in the way of traffic calming and something that was of a more urban environment. For example, you know, we accept concrete curbs, precast curbs in most places, but here, for example, you'd be wanting uh, granite curbs or, or something that's more in keeping with the conservation area. Thinking more about the road widths, et cetera. Yeah, when it comes to the road widths. So to pick up on, on one of the speaker's points, um, we very much obviously have to look at the application uh, and the, the layouts and the access points, that, which is the one unreserved matter, if you like, um, for applying new standards or current standards. And our standards, Roads in Hearts, is you know quite old now. We are reviewing it, and we I am aware of the emerging standards. And things are changing. Things like electric vehicle charging, for etc. So we are trying to you know move move with the times and be cognizant of the standards that are changing. And, you know, we are moving away from 4.1, 4.8 metre roads, 7.3 metre roads, for example, because over time, experience of installing those over the last 10, 20 years, we, we find we do get certain problems with those. And that might be that you end up with parked vehicles half on a footway, half on the road. So uh, when an applicant approaches us for pre-application advice, as has happened with this application, we, we do try and steer the developer to a, almost future-proof a design, because at the end of the day, this is outlined, so we are gonna get further reserved matters if you were to decide to approve this application tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. that at this point we are still hearing from our registered speakers we and caution us away from getting into discussion of the item before we have heard from the rest of our registered groups. Are you happy to wait, Councillor Hunter, or would you rather? Oh, okay. Shouldn't we be going to the other groups before we actually move into discussions with either? Thank you. Okay, so point taken. We can move now to our next speaker, who is Councillor Daniel Allen, who's a member advocate and here to object to the application. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Daniel Allen, I'm speaking against this application. For the third time, um, we're approaching this committee to demonstrate that proposed access for this development is not safe. My constituents in North and the Grange have been fighting this access for years now. They've employed a planning expert, a transport expert, and they've spoken with a QC. They're well organised, well funded, and are asking the right questions without receiving the answers that they so deserve. We'll come back to that. Parts County Council have contradicted themselves in their recommendations on this development. They've also purposely misled this committee on both occasions that we have sat on this Croft Lane, stating that it is only 3.8 metres wide at some points with no paths. This is definitely the case. It has to be 3.8 at certain points. They do say that it is now acceptable. Um, there are points where there are no paths and the pedestrians are using the same access as vehicles. As we've just seen on the sweep showing, vehicles are gonna be driving on the opposite side of the road when they come into that access. How is this safe for pedestrians if we're gonna have vehicles on the opposite side of the road as they sweep round? In my previous speech to this committee, I gave two examples of safety issues along Croft Lane in its current form. The width of Croft Lane has previously been proven to be a problem. When a fire occurred in the 2000s, the tender was unable to access the property as it couldn't get past a parked car on Croft Lane. 
Tender had to reverse stack down Croft Lane, go along Norton Road, up Cascio Lane, causing significant increase in time to attend the fire. A Scania fire engine is 2.3 metres wide, which is incidentally the same width as a standard ambulance. When an ambulance was called to the top of Cascio Lane in the mid-2000s, it blocked the road for over an hour as it worked on a patient. During this time, cars were mounting verges and the final small section of pathway at the top. The average mobility scooter is 0.85 metres wide. You put that at the narrowest point on Cascio Lane, sorry, on um, Croft Lane, with a fire engine or an ambulance or a dust cart or a delivery lorry, and you're looking at approximately 60 centimetres with no regulated separation. It's not safe. It's dangerous. This proves that it is an unsuitable access for an extra 40 plus properties. There's little to no safety for pedestrians at the moment, let alone with an increased footfall. Not only from the new homes, but also from the increase in footfall through Croft Lane from the Grange. Enticed by the promise of this new safe crossing on Norton Road to access Norton St Nicholas School and the industrial estate, whilst you'll no doubt hear arguments that say the development will decrease footfall across, along Cross Lane, this is not true. People will always take the shortest route between two points. We've been shown where a path could be widened, but this path only covers roughly a third of Cross Lane. Don't think this makes it safer because it doesn't. There is still a huge amount of open space that is shared for pedestrians and vehicles. Parts County Council wants to develop this patch of land and have been speaking with developers. Most of the complainants understand this and the main issue is the utter disdain for health and safety and disregard for transparency and honesty that I haven't seen in my time on planning with giving the information that has been requested. Recently, we've allowed the development of Century Grove in Hitchin by Carla Holmes. I mentioned this last time. Access to that site was along Lucas Lane and caused daily accidents during the development process due to large construction vehicles using a small lane. We're yet to see how the traffic management plan will cope with this along Croft Lane and Cascio Lane. How can you improve the access without it? We also allowed a second Carla development in Purton. And this has caused huge problems for residents with no pathways in front of their home, similar to the problems that we're going to face for residents on Croft Lane. I will repeat that I know that this committee relies on legal arguments only. Hearts County Council transport officers didn't need this meeting important enough to attend in May. Tonight they have spoken, or they will do, and I do hope they listen as well. I ask you again in front of all the people that are here, and the dozens that we know are watching on YouTube, what are you hiding with the redacted documents that you will not give to NAG, NAG? We have been asking for them repeatedly. We've been promised them and they have never been given. Why have you lied to residents about releasing them and then not given them? They've ducked, dived and generally avoided any and all questioning throughout this process, showing little respect to North Hearts District Council and none to the residents. So please do not approve this unsafe unsuitable proposal. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Can I ask members if they have any questions for Councillor Allen, please? I still have you on my list to speak. Is that an old one? Okay, not to worry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Allen. So now I'd like to invite uh, Claire Newbury, sharing with Nicola Morris, to speak, please. Thank you. Good evening. You have 10 minutes to share between you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Claire Newbury. I work for Vincent and Gorbing and the planning advisors to HCC Property. I'm sharing my speaking time with Nicola Morris from Stonemore, who will address access, design and highways considerations. I'd like to make the following points. Um, 
Firstly, the site, as I mentioned before, when I spoke, the site is allocated for residential development in the emerging local plan, which is close to adoption. This site was given full consideration at the examination, including representations by the Highways Authority, who confirmed that suitable vehicular access to the site could be achieved. The inspector did not dispute the suitability of the site for residential development. The scheme benefits, um, Sam has spoken a bit about these already, but it will provide market and affordable housing to meet identified needs within the district. It's 40% affordable housing in line with the draft local plan policy. It will provide 0.37 hectares of public open space, which is three times the amount required to meet the policy standards. It will deliver employment during construction, greater use and investment in local community facilities and off-site improvements to encourage walking and cycling. Just to cover the impact on heritage assets, heritage assessment was carried out, which identified and assessed all the heritage assets within the vicinity of the site. This found that the principal setting of the listed buildings is their substantial garden plots. The assessment found that overall, the site makes a neutral contribution to the conservation area of Croft Lane. The assessment found limited intervisibility between Croft Lane and the site, which is limited to the point of access. The illustri illustrative scheme provides a low density layout at 11 dwellings per hectare, set in generous plots, deep front gardens and tree-lined streets, reflecting the surrounding pattern of development. The access of Croft Lane will um, the dimensions of which have kept have been kept um, tight as possible to replicate a country lane will be framed within an 80 meter landscaped corridor, maintaining the open gap along Croft Lane. The heritage assessment concluded that the illustrative layout will result in no harm to the significance of the listed buildings or the conservation area. Detailed discussions have taken place with NHDC officers and planning and conservation officers and the highways authority. And this included consideration of a number of access options, which Sam has detailed tonight. To conclude, in assessing the planning balance, it has been concluded that the access proposed results in the least amount of harm to the conservation area, while still delivering a scheme that is safe in highways terms and meets the objectives of LTP4 to encourage sustainable transport, whilst delivering the identified public benefits. This assessed balance is in line, in line with paragraph 196 of the MPPF. Matters of concern relating to the detailed design offer consideration at the reserve matter stage. Good evening, my name is Nicola Morris, I'm director of Stowmore Limited. Stowmore Limited prepared the transport assessment for the proposed development. My colleague's statement at the previous planning committee set out the history of the access strategy for the site, which has evolved following extensive discussions with both the highway authority and the planning authority. The key points from that are as follows. A number of access options have been considered in some detail. On balance, the Croft Lane access was agreed for motor vehicle access, the Cascio Lane access for pedestrians and cycles only. The scale of development is low density, so impact would be minimal. Traffic survey data for Croft Lane indicated that it is likely lightly trafficked and speeds are below 30 miles an hour. And accident data from Hearts County Council shows, shows no personal injury accidents recorded on Croft Lane or Cascio Lane between January 2016 and December 2020. The current access design has evolved from advice provided by Hearts County Council Highways in terms of highways and sustainable transport and North Hearts District Council in terms of the conservation area. Some of the key features are as follows. Predicted traffic generation and associated impact would be low. The Cascio Lane access would be for pedestrian and cycle access only. This will give a sustainable travel priority for key journeys towards the centre of Letchworth, the station and employment areas. Retaining the low speed traffic environment on Croft Lane and providing some localised widening at the site access and at the eastern end of Cascio Lane. Retaining the good visibility along Croft Lane, implementing some off-site measures to improve pedestrian crossing facilities at either end of Croft Lane, and contributing towards delivery of a new pedestrian crossing on Norton Road. This strategy was considered to be LTP policy compliant by HCC. 
Some key issues were raised at the previous committee meeting, including number one, road safety. Two road safety audits have been undertaken for Croft Lane site access strategies. Neither audit identified any significant or fundamental safety concerns and Hearts County Council has accepted both. A regular review of accident data has confirmed no indication of an accident problem in Croft Lane. Traffic growths. Existing traffic flows on Croft Lane and Cashio Lane are very light. Therefore, the additional traffic equates to a significant increase in percentage terms. However, actual increases will be modest in terms of the total volume of traffic, as agreed and acknowledged by HCC. To put this into perspective, currently uh, approximately one vehicle every two and a half minutes goes down Croft Lane in the AM peak, uh, with one vehicle every one and a half minutes in the PM peak. This is expected to increase by one additional vehicle every four minutes in the AM period and one additional vehicle every three to four minutes in the PM period. Some vehicles, such as waste vehicles, delivery vehicles, emergency vehicles, will already be on the network serving existing properties. Number three, emergency access. Emergency vehicles will be able to access Croft Lane access from two directions. Number four, pedestrian demand. The transport assessment includes pedestrian trips in Appendix I. It predicts 35 arrivals and 37 departures between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. This demand will be split between the two accesses, Cashio Lane and Croft Lane, and in three different directions from the south, west, and the east. The Norton Road Crossing. Hearts County Council Highways identified this crossing as an existing requirement, identified via ongoing work on the Letchworth and Bulldog transport ban. Therefore, it's assumed that the implications of this crossing have been fully considered by the transport plan process. The initial development proposal for this site included a contribution towards the cost of the potential new crossing, and subsequent discussions with HCC have resulted in the proposed development agreeing to implement the crossing in full in order to be LTP policy compliant, and that will be required in the planning conditions. So in conclusion, the access strategy for the site has considered a range of options and the current solution considers the advice of North Hearts District Council and HCC Highways regarding the access and impact on the conservation area. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do the members have any questions for our speakers, please? Councillor David Levitt. Thank you. I've got one for each of the two speakers, actually, Chair, if that's okay. So for the first speaker, um, you mentioned the local plan hearings and the fact that uh, it was confirmed that suitable vehicle access could be achieved. The context that comment was made in at those hearings and the comments were made was in response to the uh, responses to the um, local plan questionnaires where residents and other people raised concerns about the sa about um, safety issues and suitable access to that site for the volume of housing being proposed. There was at the time no link to the conservation area uh, and, and the response was made uh, based on the available guidance at the time. I don't think LTP4 was there because it certainly wasn't mentioned, but the design for highways was mentioned at the time and the design for highways manual uh, mentioned uh, was entered into the examination documents. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it that that um, confirmed suitable access could be achieved uh, would conform to the, the highways manual at the time. Uh, and for the second speaker, the road safety audits, you said there was two of them. Was either of them a safer route to school safety audit? Thank you. Can I invite the speakers to respond? Thank you. Um, regarding my comment um, about the um, conclusions of the Highway Authority at the examination, um, that they were questioned at the time uh, about the, the allocation of the site. We have since had detailed discussions with the Highway Authority to discuss the detailed access, so I feel that we have more than covered and discussed the, the suitability of the access that is before you. In response to the second question, uh, the safety audit uh, assessed the flat top humps at the eastern end of Croft Lane 
The proposed widening on the northern side of Croft Lane in the vicinity of Norton Pond access to incorporate bollards and prevent verge erosion. 5.5 metre development access onto Croft Lane, localised widening of the existing footway along Croft Lane and to achieve the two metres width footways and the new uncontrolled pedestrian crossing facility at the intersection of Croft Lane and Cascio Lane in terms of, so it's, it's assessing the proposals for improvements. The question was quite simple. Was either of those two road safety audits a safer routes to school audit? No, yes or no? Sorry. No, it was on the proposed improvements to the accesses and Croft Lane. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask the case officer, Sam DeCoco, if he has any, um, if he'd like to respond to any of the points made. Uh, thank you, Chair, but uh, the majority of the points that have been made, I believe, are directed in respect to safe access and egress, uh, which I will refer to Hertfordshire County Council. The only matter that did come up was my assessment of the uh, significance of the, con of the site to the conservation area, and that is my professional opinion, as inconvenient as it may be. Thank you. Thank you. So before we move to debate, would members like to ask any questions of the highways officer, Mark Youngerman, at this stage? Councillor Mike Rice. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yes, good evening. Um, I would just like some clarification, um, possibly trying to clear up things within my own mind. I keep hearing about work on Croft Lane. I'm trying to establish, is Croft Lane going to be widened? Is there going to be a proper footpath put in? I don't have uh, any problem with the access onto the site. I think that's fine. My problem is with Croft Lane itself, the traffic on Croft Lane. Is anything going to be done on Croft Lane? Thank you for the question. I'll try and help with, with that if I can. So there is a scheme of um, calming measures that, that go together with the new junction. So there's a new proposed junction layout, which you saw on the slides. It was option 7B um, that, that uh, is, is the most likely one to proceed to section 278 works if the application was successful. And what goes with that? So the although it looks like a table on the plan, it's it's a sort of it's a change in materials, so it's not going to be a massive road hump, uh, which was one of the other options. It's it's a change in materials. We haven't agreed that palette of materials. It's got to be something that's agreed with the LPA in, a coordinate, in coordination with us, so that um, uh, we we're not worried about the asset management of those products. And also, where you towards the end of Croft Lane, the eastern end. There's a, a speed table that's proposed at the, which is very near the end of footpath uh, 31, which helps people cross, not only cross where there's an existing uh, drop curb at the moment, but um, it'll help slow people down as they turn off Norton Road into Croft Lane. And then um, there are other measures proposed like one of the speakers mentioned, there's about a third of the existing footway that um, widening of that footway is proposed. And also for the other sections, there'll be um, some warning signs on the, that are shown on the drawing, no footway for so many yards, etc. Does that help at all? Would you like to respond, Councillor Rice? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Um, I don't think it really answers my question. My question is, are you going to do anything about the width of the carriageway? Um, I think everybody's concern is how narrow it is. The amount of traffic that's going to be uh, going al <coughs> along it compared to now. Um, and obviously, 
large vehicles meeting smaller vehicles, etc. Um, we're being told it's 3.8 meters wide. Um, to my knowledge, that doesn't sort of comply with what highways would want on a new development of access to the development. I've not got a problem with the access off Croft Lane onto the site. My problem is with Croft Lane itself and the amount of traffic is going to be using Croft Lane. So what I wanted to clarify in my mind was, is anything going to be done on Croft Lane, Croft Lane to widen that and ease the problem as far as a shared surface for both pedestrians and vehicles? The light. Thank you. So we're... So it's not the Highway Authority making the proposals. Obviously, it's the applicant, but uh, we worked with them on a, on a set of mitigations, including like the pedestrian crossing mentioned on Norton Road that's well on the way to being designed. Um, but we're not proposing that that uh, Croft Lane is widened to five and a half metres or anything near that, um, nor that it gets a brand new footway because it goes back to one of the earlier questions in that we're trying to be respectful of the conservation area. And, and linked with that is obviously our preference to have a sustainable link on Cashio Lane. Because, you know, with LTP4, our policy one is not only firstly about reducing, um, trying to reduce journeys, but uh, then make sure that any journeys caused by gro the growth that we're seeing uh, is firstly by sustainable means where we can um, try and help make that happen. So obviously the access point on Cashio Lane feeds you in the right direction to get to all the, to the town centre and uh, link up with uh, existing and proposed future cycle routes. And it's also due to the corridor whips. I know you, you said you're, you're less concerned with the site, but it is a, a factor on our preferences because the corridor um, of just over eight metres onto Cashio Lane uh, it's a very narrow corridor, which works quite well for a sustainable link for walking and cycling, but it's not very good for trying to get uh, the one point of vehicular access through together with all the utilities and all the other things that, uh, that go with a brand new highway. So that's part of the reason that our preference is that the vehicular access is further away from town so that we're trying to encourage people to walk and cycle into town and, and also, as part of considering the application, we've looked at the accident record. There's, there's uh, as per the TA, although I've checked today on the most recent accident data, there's no injury accidents registered on Cashio Lane nor Croft Lane. So we've looked at that and the traffic flows, like it's been mentioned before, it's not a very dense development. Obviously, if it was a block of flats or something a lot more denser, then maybe we would have given a different response. But with a dense, with a you know, a not a very dense uh, development here, and looking at the traffic figures that Nicola mentioned earlier, um, although percentage it looks bad in terms of real numbers, it, it's not a great number of vehicles adding on to what already uses that lane. Hope that helps. Thank you, Councillor Tony Hunter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple of my questions have already been answered. Um, I'm quite used to professionals having a different opinion, especially when it comes to planning or highways. Um, nothing new there. I think I'll cut to the chase and ask a direct question of Mr. Youngman. In your professional opinion, would this um, development have an adverse effect on highway safety and people using it? Simple yes or no. There's, there's no evidence to, because obviously if we come forward with a recommendation for refusal, we have to evidence, possibly at appeal, that it has a severe impact on the highway network. Like I was just saying with the accident record, et cetera, there is no evidence to show to me um, that, that I should be, as a, as a highways professional, concerned about allowing this development. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'd like to move to the debate now. Before we do, I'd just like to make clear my position in this debate. As most will see from the minutes of the planning control meeting held on the 27th of May 2021, I seconded a motion to refuse this application on highway grounds. As you'll be aware, the motion has been deferred until today to allow an officer from the County Council to attend the meeting and provide further information on the matter. I've spoken with the Deputy Monitoring Officer who has confirmed unable, I am able to participate on this item as the reason I seconded will be dealt with at this meeting, as we have an officer from the County Council to provide information on the highways matter that was not available at the last meeting. As always, I come with an open mind to hear the issues and make an informed decision based on the presentation provided at the time. So can we move to the debate, please? Sorry. Oh, yes. Sorry, before we move to the debate, Councillor Morgan Derbyshire. Would... Thank you, Madam Chairman. As members will know, I have objected to this application from the very beginning. I've sought legal advice from our planning lawyer who has advised me I can take part in the debate to make my view clear, but I cannot take part in the vote. And once I have finished speaking, I will move to the public arena. Thank you, Councillor Derbyshire. Apologies, I don't think that was quite right. What I said was you could exercise your your councillor speaking right so you can speak on the item, but then you have to move to the public arena and not speak on the debate or the vote. So if you have any opinions to express them now and then move to the public arena. Thank you for clarifying. Um, may I thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep my remarks short and I agree with everything that my fellow ward colleague, Councillor Allen has said and Councillor Bloxham previously and the concerns raised by Northern Action Group. A lane of 3.8 metres wide is not enough to cope with the volume of traffic generated by this development. Only this week I've had uh, emails from residents in Croft Lane about issues of congestion. Building 42 more homes will only lead to more congestion and with a street that does not have a public footpath street that's widely used by many people in Letchworth, it's simply not safe. I believe at paragraph 9 section 108 and 109 in the MPPF is strong enough grounds to refuse planning permission. Uh, subsection 109 states that planning should be refused on highways grounds only if it would lead to an unacceptable impact on highway safety. Well, in my opinion, this development does have a huge impact on the highway safety, and I believe it should be refused for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Derbyshire. Can we now move to the debate? Oh, Councillor Levitt, would you like to speak first? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, um, I don't have any problems with the principle of development on this site, numbers, etc. The design is a, is a reserve matter, so we'll, we can deal with that as it later on. Very pleased to see Hearts Highways here tonight because every time we've seen this, all the concerns have been, been around highway safety and unanswered questions uh, and, 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 and whether um, whether it is a, whether highway safety has been compromised or not. The officer from the highways was quite clear tonight in that when I asked the question around um, would this be acceptable, it's not in a conservation area, uh, this is quite an old application, and a lot of the design and work and stuff's been done on old policies. And, and I think the answer was that in an ideal world, you'd probably like it to be a, a wider access road if the conservation area was, wasn't a consideration. I'm going to throw something else into the mix, actually, which is part of the NPPF as well. Uh, one we haven't mentioned so far, uh, and that's Chapter 12 of the NPPF, uh, Achieving Well-Designed Places. I'm mean, referring in particular to uh, paragraph 127, uh, which is planning policies and decisions should ensure that developments, and there's a number of subparagraphs under that, and I'm going to particularly refer to paragraphs A and F. A will function well and add the overall quality of the area, not just for the short term, but over the lifetime of the development. And 
F says, let me just get to it, create places that are safe, inclusive and accessible and which promote health and well-being with a high standard of amenity for existing and future users. Now, this is based on a as-is situation. Things are going to change. As my office mentioned, electric vehicles, people double parking, you need more space. We don't want that sort of thing happening. So I think it is actually in con allowing this development to go ahead is actually con in contravention of that because it's designed for the past, not for the future. It doesn't take that future movement into account. It is, the development is supposed to be for sustainable family homes, which are going to have children. I'm really, really concerned that there has been no safer route to schools uh, survey taken into this at all. As people going along there will know that parts of that road further along, which aren't part of the development, but are part of the route to school, do not have sufficient footpath, do not have any footpath, in fact. So that's not going to be very good as far as that chapter 12 bit goes, is it? Um, I, I'm... It's, it's a, it's, it's a toss-up, this one. Uh, the, the, the quote we got was, provide some form of access that is technically accessible uh, because it is to minimise the impact on the conservation area. My thoughts are, when does the impact on the conservation area override potential safety issues for future residents and a future, when do you accept that compromise? And I think I've come to the conclusion after listening to this, uh, this has been a really difficult one. This is a step too far. This is a compromise too far to meet the requirements of, of the conservation area. So I'm going to propose, Chair, that we refuse this application uh, on par the paragraphs are quoted from the NPPF chapter, paragraph 127, achieving well designed places. Also, it fails to meet the policies of LTP4 and does not meet the standards of the highways, HCC's own highways design manual. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Levitt. We do have other members I'm waiting to speak, but do I have a seconder for Councillor Levitt's? Thank you, Councillor Rice. Are you seconding Councillor Levitt's proposal to refuse this application? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Mantle. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I totally disagree with a lot of what has been said. To me, the conservation value of the whole of the Croft Lane uh, area is so high that anything which drives a great suburban road through the middle of it is, to my mind, totally unacceptable. We've stuck, got stuck with having designated this site for development, so that's not an option we can really very easily go back on, having uh, put it in our local plan and support it at the inquiry. But I do not think that the gaining of about 42 houses warrants driving a great modern suburban road right through the middle of what is a very attractive conservation area and a very attractive lane. And we have professional advice from the highways that it is actually usable and acceptable without that uh, massive engineering which would be required. And I, I really do feel that we're getting numbers a little out of proportion when we're talking about road safety. We're talking about an extra 40 odd houses, many of which will, have, as has been said, will use the uh, Casio Lane access and uh, more, more so in the future with things like electric bikes, um, uh, mobility scooters and things like that, which will presumably be able to use that access rather than have to go around uh, Croft Lane. Uh, and I do not think that while the percentages look high, they are tiny numbers and a big percentage of next to nothing is still next to nothing. 
I do not support the proposal. I think that this is one which, given that I would much prefer we weren't developing this field in the first place, but as we've made that decision and committed ourselves on that one, I think that the damage which would be done to the whole of Croft Lane uh, by this uh, major engineering works just simply for some putative uh, additional safety is just not justified and not acceptable in terms of the harm it would cause to the community as a whole and to the whole of that part of Letchworth. Thank you, Councillor Mantle. Do I have anybody else you'd like to speak? Shall we go to the vote then? So we've had a proposal from... Um, yeah, if I may, Chair, I think um, you were going to ask, weren't you, what, what the specific reasons for refusal were. Um, I'm not being asked to advise on them at all. You want me to? Do, well, is that what you'd like me to do? Um, I think the thread of the reason for refusal is um, around highway safety and the, the inadequacy of Croft Lane. But then we would, uh, Councillor Levitt, who's moved refusal, was talking about paragraph 127F, which does refer to safe, create places that are safe, inclusive, and accessible. I mean, that I, you, you could thread a reason for refusal along those lines. I'm a bit concerned that, that, that paragraph 127 is, is about design as a whole. And um, Councillor Levitt did say that he doesn't have a problem with housing on this site. And he's being very incisive about highway safety and looking at um, using, Paragraph 27F is about design and looking at it in the round. It, it's difficult to argue that it's re relevant, wholly relevant to a specific incisive issue of highway safety. You might want to look at um, some of the paragraphs, other paragraphs in the MPPF around 109. And then you've got your policies in your emerging plan, have you T1 that de deals with highway safety. So you could you perhaps you could tack in 127F at the end so that you've because it refers to safe safe places doesn't it but maybe you could say something like now this is specifically about highway safety isn't it you're not you're not it's not conservation so it's the access would would generate in the opinion of the local planning authority the access to this proposed development would would generate additional traffic onto Croft Lane which has a substandard road width um to the which the additional traffic would be to the detriment of highway safety in the locality the proposal would therefore con conflict with policy t1 of the emerging local plan and paragraphs 109 and 127f of the national planning policy framework that i think that captures it chair and that there was no provision to build a footpath because that would encroach on the conservation area around the corner of Croft Lane, past the entrance onto the Greenway. I'm not sure, Is, are we, I'll take advice from you, Annette, are we uh, moving into a different reason I, there? I, I, I think, Chair, the, the, uh, the, 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 the point is we have to put specific policies in our refusal. And I, I think Mr. Ellis has picked up the ones I, I didn't mention, but I have got written down here. I have got T1 written down there, the Emerging Local Plan. Uh, paragraph 109 of the N F NPPF, and I've also got uh, SP6 and 7 of the Emerging Local Plan may be applicable as well. So I think what uh, Mr Ellis has um, 
summed up is, is probably what I'm trying to say in the, in the proper technical terms. Thank you, Councillor Levitt. Thank you, thank you, Simon. Councillor Bishop. Thank, thank you. Uh, well, it's mentioned in the report, policy 21 of the SLP, is that any use? Harm identified through conflict with policy 21 of the SLP and loss of designated open space. Do you want me to address that? Could you respond, Simon? Yes. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, I understand the point um, Councillor Bishop's making, uh, but that, that's really about development on the whole site, isn't it? Policy 21 is the, the landscape and open space pattern. And can, members will remember that they did grant permission for a very similar development not too far away from here, which is also policy 21 not that long ago. I think, you know, if you wanted to raise a refusal on policy 21, you're really striking at the heart of any development on this site and sort of holding out for the existing local plan vis-a-vis -vis the new one. And I think the point about access, you're not, and as Councillor Levitt's point was, that he's not against development on the site. He's just very concerned about the access. And I think that's the tone of the debate. Whereas if you go for policy 21, you're almost sort of ruling out development on the site at all. And um, given that we have allocated this in the emerging local plan, um, that might be a bit of a stretch too far. Thank you. Are you happy with the response, Councillor Bishop? Thank you. OK, so we have a proposal and we have a seconder. Are we happy to move to the vote? So. Over to you, William. Thank you. Have all members voted? Chair, that motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to item seven on the agenda. Thank you to everybody who took part in this um, application. We do actually. Okay, so thank you to everybody who took part in this debate. Um, and before we move on to the next item, we'll take a break if that's okay. Oh, can I just say that speakers are asked to leave via the fire exit. Thank you.
Can you please turn off all your phones? Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's you. Oh, good. <laughs> ah, was it? Can I confirm we're live? Thank you, Chair. We are still broadcasting. So we'll move on to item seven on the agenda. This is application number 20 forward slash 03018 forward slash FP, land west of Royston Bypass, Royston, Hertfordshire. Erection of 73 bed care home within class C2 parking, access, landscaping, and other associated works. And the officer to present is Sam DeCoco again. Sam. Thank you, Chair. So, one moment. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Chair. So there are some preliminary matters on this application. Um, First of all, the drawing numbers, uh, some of them haven't shown the accurate revisions on the, um, on the committee report. I can confirm that I have considered and the report is based on these updated revision numbers. And I will just list them now uh, with reference only to the four unique digits at the end of the drawing numbers. Um, with the revision number to follow, and these will be updated before the decision is issued. So 0101 will be Rev P2. 0201 will be Rev P6. 0211 will be Rev P6. 0221 to Rev P6. 2701 to Rev P2 and 0401 to Rev P2. I will also add that the extension in the deadline to determination has been agreed to tomorrow, the 16th of the 7th, 2021, not the date which I've got in the officer report. Um, and the, uh, the applicant has drawn my attention to a few small inaccuracies in my officer report, not material to alter my recommendation. In paragraph 4.2.4, .4, I refer to the car park being in the southeast corner. It's in fact been moved to the northeast corner. And in section 4.3.21 um, of the report, I made reference to six secure cycle spaces. The applicant has said they intend to secure eight, which is an improvement. Um, uh, the, in, in, refer, in reference to paragraph 4.3.23, I referred to policy comments that were made on a previous application, which I will update members in a moment, um, but those policy comments are still considered relevant to this application in that context. And there is one late representation which has been received from Hertfordshire County Council Growth and Infrastructure. I say it was a late representation. They have evidence that it was sent on the 12th of January, 2021. However, it wasn't received. Uh, this uh, representation requests a contribution of 2,774 pounds towards library services within the section 106. This is a very similar amount to what was secured on a previous application and was submitted in the draft section 106 agreement. So I don't think the applicant who is speaking tonight is going to have an issue with it. So I will amend my recommendation to recommend the grant of planning permission subject to the following conditions and following the completion of a section 106 agreement delivering the requirements of Hertfordshire County Council as local highways authority and Hertfordshire County Council growth and infrastructure team 
in respect to the provision of fire hydrants and the financial contribution of £2,774, index linked to PubSIC 175, towards library services at Royston Library. That is the end of the updates. And like I said, they don't impact my uh, considerations and my recommendation on this application. They are just updates and points of clarification. So members may remember, again, this is a similar scheme that was presented for refusal on this site for a care home. Uh, the refusal, which was uh, agreed at committee, uh, was appealed and that appeal was allowed. As such, there is an extant planning permission for a development of the same use and size as proposed herein in terms of the number of bedrooms. Uh, and that is a material planning consideration to be weighed in the merits of the application. The key consideration of this application in light of that fallback position is whether the proposed building would preserve the character of Royston to a greater or lesser degree than that already approved. I will also mention before we go on with the uh, presentation of the actual uh, drawings and the site itself, that the appeal uh, was supplemented by a unilateral undertaken, which is the equivalent of a section 106 agreement. And the inspector in allowing the appeal struck off the requirement for a affordable housing commuted sum for reasons which are within that appeal report, which will be presented to committee later on within this committee agenda. So if we could start the presentation, please. Thank you, next slide, please. So here we have the site and our GIS system has been updated to show development within phase one of the development site. So this whole area is, was designated in our emerging local plan for residential development. Outline planning permission has been approved for residential development and phases one and two of the reserve matters have been approved and construction is underway. This section of the site is 0.51 hectares in site area, which is the reason I'm presenting at committee today. And it is a section of phase three, which is going to be removed from the residential development to provide a care home. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, here we go with the, uh, the, this is a site plan showing the reserve matters that have been approved at phases one and two of what I could, what I call in my report, the wider development site. Um, as you can see, the proposed site is alongside the main access and egress vehicularly to the site from the A505. Next slide, please. So here we have the landscaping plan. Now, the key variations in this uh, landscaping plan are that the front garden has been moved closer to the wider residential development and the car park has been tucked away in the, in, in the bottom left hand corner of the diagram shown. We still have tiered gardens. Uh, to reflect changes in levels throughout the site. As you go from the bottom of the image to the top, uh, the land rises significantly. So you've got three meter, uh, three meter rises in the flat gardens uh, as the site progresses towards the top of the image. Next slide, please. So here we have it within, uh, with the correct orientation. So yes, it's the north, uh, north of the site has the car park now and you can see the planting layout and the uh, the area of the proposed care home i will also note in this particular image that the uh, wing to the south uh, that you can see there has been moved closer to the street and this assists in obscuring some of the engineered land levels which i previously raised a concern in the previous application Next slide, please. 
So here we've got the elevations. As you can see, the scale of the development has been reduced from the previous application, which went up to three stories in the central part. The whole development is now restricted to majority. The appearance will be two stories in height, as you can see, uh, with some accommodation in the roof visible from some aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you've got the rest of the elevations. Again, I'll just uh, add to that previous slide that you can see some variation in the uh, in the, in the depths of the property of the building as it goes along to break up the bulk and the scale and the massing of the development. Next slide, please. Uh, here we've got some sections with some more detailed. Uh, elevation showing the materials and the variation in materials that you'll get throughout the site and showing those uh, different sectional land levels and garden levels as you move through the site to make sure that the access to those gardens is sufficient for uh, proposed occupiers. Next slide please. Uh, here we've got some slides that show the uh, sort of visibility of the site from the A505 in the bottom section there and showing the relationship between the site and proposed indicative neighbouring properties in phase three. I will note that we have had uh, reserve matters or are considering reserve matters applications for phase three and the relationship is as shown here and I have no concerns about that relationship between properties in both the reserve matters and in this application. Next slide, please. So here we have the uh, what's considered the lower ground floor of the three floors of the building. There are three floors as it rises towards the rear, but there aren't ever three stories on one particular area other than two stories with basement level. So you can see here the uh, an entrance to the site. The facilities within the building are quite varied. So you've got the cafeteria and some other facilities. And this floor is largely your laundry and, uh, uh, and rooms which don't require windows. Next slide, please. Here we've got what is considered the ground floor of the three stories. And it's your uh, general layout that you would find with these developments. Next slide, please. And this is considered the upper floor. You'll see there are there is a roof terrace there, but as you can see from the elevations, that roof terrace is obscured from any vantage point and it won't appear uh, incongruous or dominant in any vantage points. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the applicants provided some CGIs, which are what I consider accurate representations of the level of detailing and the materials to be proposed, as well as semi-mature planting, uh, an, an accurate description of how this building will appear. Um, as you can see, the, the sort of architectural detailing that's going into this particular building is considered high quality and of some merit. Next slide, please. Okay, so this CGI is aimed to show the relationship between the uh, C2 care home proposed and what is likely to come forward on phase three of the wider development site. Um, you can see that the sort of retaining wall issue that I had a concern with earlier has been partially resolved by bringing the wing closest to the neighboring phase three development closer to the road to have a better relationship. Next slide, please. Uh, there it is without the red line, so it's just a clearer image. Next slide. Uh, this is a CGI that was requested by the landscape and design officer, urban design officer, to show that the car park will generally be at a lower level than the boundary hedging and the bund required adjacent to the access wall. It shows that the car park will be largely screened from vantage points. Next slide, please. And finally, I believe this is the last slide. This is just showing the relationship between uh, the rear of properties on phase three as they're likely to be proposed and the larger C2 building proposed herein, uh, which I consider an acceptable relationship. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so now on to the site photos. I've taken these site photos from the highest vantage point on the on what I consider to be the actual site proposed for development here. Uh, this looks down onto phase one, which is largely completed. Next slide, please. Uh, this looks down to what will be phase two and some of phase three with Royston in the backdrop there. Next slide, please. And finally, that's a view onto what will be phase three, just showing the land levels and the sort of relationship we're going to get between this site and the wider development site. I think the next slide, please. At the end of my presentation, Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do members have any questions for the officer? No. Okay, could I invite our first speaker? Um, Laura Grimerson, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Laura Brimerson and I'm from Gillings Planning. I'm the agent for this planning application and I'm here tonight on behalf of Frontier Estates, who are the applicant, and Quantum Care, who will be the operator for the proposed care home. Frontier Estates are an award-winning developer in the care home sector who work with care home operators to deliver much needed accommodation for the elderly. Quantum Care are a Hertfordshire-based not-for-profit care provider who have worked with Hertfordshire County Council for nearly 30 years. Members will be aware that Quantum currently operate Richard Cox House in Royston. This new home would be reflective of Quantum's other homes by catering for a mixture of people living with dementia and complex physical needs. All residents will require 24 hour specialist care and support to help with the everyday tasks that most of us take for granted, in addition to medical support from the nursing team. In reality, residents will be highly unlikely to be able to leave unaccompanied and will benefit from on-site services to help them day to day. It's taken almost three years to get to this point, and as members will be aware, there have been two applications for a care home on this site in that time. We're really pleased that the first application has recently been approved at appeal, as is reported later on the agenda. The second application proposes an amended scheme of a reduced scale. The proposal still seeks to provide 73 much needed beds, but in a building which is predominantly two stories in height. We have worked to minimise levels differences between the care home and future residential development. And the care home will sit at a comparable height to that of neighbouring properties, which are subject to current reserve matters applications. As with the recently approved scheme, the amended scheme adopts an innovative approach to levels. The care home is set across three equal plateaus, ensuring that two storeys of accommodation are visible externally. This has the added benefit of allowing for direct resident access to gardens from each floor something which is not possible with most standard care homes. There are extensive benefits associated with the proposed scheme, as acknowledged in the recent appeal decision. Social benefits relate to the provision of much needed care beds in response to a local shortfall in the town, resulting in wider benefits to health and well-being for local people and reducing NHS pressure. Addressing this shortfall means that local people will be, will be able to access the care they need in their hometown at a time in their lives when being close to family and friends is vital. Regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, purpose-built care homes are needed now more than ever, as starting from scratch means that there are opportunities to embed infection control from the outset. The fact is that Royston doesn't have any care home beds with ensuite provision, a very sad statistic indeed, and one that we are looking to rectify. Care home beds with ensuite provision are considered the bare minim minimum these days and are essential when it comes to infection control. There is also a significant contribution to the overall housing land supply of an equivalent 41 units. We believe that the, pros the proposals complement the dwellings on the wider site, contributing to the creation of mixed and balanced communities. Turning to economic benefits, in the short term, the proposal will result in construction jobs and a general uplift in productivity. In the long term, around 53 full-time equivalent jobs will be created at the home, which will also generate income for the local area. 
Environmentally, the proposal seeks to deliver a care home on a site which is considered by the council to be an appropriate and sustainable location for development. The adoption of a high quality design approach will ensure that the proposed care home will complement the character of development on the wider site and form an attractive entrance feature into the site. Further benefits will be provided through provision of additional landscaping and biodiversity enhancements. We hope you agree that this proposal will make a valuable contribution to the delivery of much needed care accommodation, providing a greater choice for the elderly population of Royston and allowing them to remain close to their families and in their hometown. We believe the home can be a fantastic example of a modern quality care facility, and we hope that you're able to support the application this evening in line with the officer recommendation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Can I ask members if they have any questions for the speaker? Councillor Levitt. Thank you, Chair. Um, bearing in mind, you now, now have permission for the previously submitted development through the appeal. Um, and the concerns that members raised at that point were about the design and scale. If you were approved planning permission tonight on this one, which one would you build? <laughs> I thought that would might be like a question. Would you like to respond? Um, yes. Uh, we haven't made a decision yet, but we'll decide when we have the decision for this one as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I ask the case officer, Sam, if there's any um, anything you'd like to respond to before we move on to the debate? Uh, no, nothing for me. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the debate. Who'd like to kick off? No? Oh, Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, interesting question and uh, the answer I expected. I think we're in a situation, actually, that uh, this particular proposal, looking at it in depth, is far superior to the one that we looked at initially. And I'm more than happy to go along with the officer's um, recommendation to grant and hope that um, they take on board our comments and build the right scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mantle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to second that proposal. I think this will be a great addition to the amenities of Royston. I think we should support it. Uh, and I hope they will build this one, not the one that was granted on appeal. Thank you, Councillor Mantle. Shall we move to the vote then? Thank you, have all members voted? Chair, that motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you'd like to leave via the fire exit, I think that's right, isn't it? Yes, please. Thank you very much. So moving on to our last item tonight, item eight on the agenda. This is item number, planning application number 21 forward slash 00401 forward slash FP Land Ival Court, Radburn Way, Letchworth Garden City, Hertfordshire. This is for a residential development comprising of one five story building providing 24 apartments, three times one bed apartments, 20 times two bed, and one times three bed, with associated car parking access and landscaping. Additional plan received on the 4th of May 2021. And the officer to present is Simon Ellis. Thank you, Simon. Over to you. Um, Councillor Levitt, sorry, before we start. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Before we start, uh, I'd like to like, raise a legal matter in relation to this particular application. Um, the, the application site is, is in the ownership of North Hertfordshire District Council. Uh, it came, it was approved for sale in 2011 by Cabinet, subsequently came back to Cabinet in 2014 for details. Um, and 
the we are the local planning authority deciding this application on something our own land the sale was conditional on gaining planning permission the develop the the, the purchaser uh, was said i will buy it subject to gaining relevant planning permission as a member who was involved in the original decision to sell that, that site uh, as a, a cabinet member at the time i do think i'm somewhat compromised in taking part in this debate um we do have what i'm not sure if i can use the word now you do have what was called a chinese wall in place where we separate the disposal of the asset from the planning permission as the local planning authority and you should not have any crossover as chairman i've stood on both sides of this wall um i i think I, I i should not take any part in this debate whatsoever because i feel i'm too compromised despite the fact it's in my ward um and i uh, just just um possibly ask the legal officer just for to explain to the other members after we've gone about the chinese wall thing and on why it's in place for the for the newer members of the committee thank you chair thank you councillor levitt um, councillor hunter uh thank you chairman uh I was a member of the same cabinet that came to this conclusion, so for the same reasons I will be leaving and uh, will not enter into the decision making as far as this item is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. Would you like to offer any advice? Or... Um, it's just to say that um, obviously, while the council has many hats on um, this particular um, for this particular item, the uh, hat that Councillor Levitt and Councillor Hunter were speaking on was as the executive, and as such, have made um, a decision based that would have an impact on our ability to fetter our discretion, their discretion to be able to decide on the planning application as well. It would be seen by um, the reasonable person as a predetermination on the application. Thank you both. So, So thank you both. And we'll move over to the planning officer, um, Simon Ellis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have no updates, but we'll go to the slides if we may. Can we have the next one, please? Here's the, uh, the location site. Just off the um, the long about there, Radburn Way, Ival Court Tower behind it, and the community centre, Jackman's community centre behind it as well, and Hadley, the uh, old people's home there. Can I have the next slide, please? And that's a block plan. That's that's the block plan of the proposed development, showing the uh, steps to the right leading into Ival Court car park behind accessing from Radburn Way, just as you come off the long about, closing the existing access, which used to lead to a informal car park in that location before the land was sealed off prior to this planning application. Can have the next slide, please. There's a planting plan, which brings it to life a bit more, showing you the different landscaping ideas around the site and specific planting proposals to soften the impact of any development on the site can I have the next slide and this is a slightly better plan again again showing you a, a more up close block plan you can see the, the landscaping proposals around and the block with the pedestrian access onto the footpath and then access to the cycles or sorry the bin stores on either side of the vehicular access, recycling on one side and normal waste on the other side. And then another footpath link to um, Radburn Way and any bin collection would be curbside collection and that's been confirmed as acceptable by the waste collection team. Now the next slide, please. These are elevations. Um, there's the front elevation. You can see that it's, 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 they're calling it a uh, lower ground floor and then four floors above. That's lower ground because it's built, it's bank, banking into the, uh, the land slightly. So if you take the next slide, I think it might have the, 
um, rear elevation. You know, you'll be able to see what I mean. So it's four stories on one side and five stories on the other. So can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, there's the rear elevation and it's a 15 metre high building proposed with some plant on the top. And the next one, please. This is just a close up of the uh, bin stalls that I mentioned on either side of the access. And then that's a gate to secure the car parking. I know members are not keen on gated communities, but I'm struggling to think of another way that you could retain the car parking for the, uh, the residents of the development. Next slide, please. Here's some uh, floor plans, lower ground floor plan. You'll see cycle stores are actually within the building itself on the lower ground. So there is cycle store provision in the development block itself. And then you've got the flats around um, different, different uh, number of bedroom flats, eight of which would be shared ownership units, which I've mentioned in the report. Uh, next slide, please. So this is some photographs of the wider area. That's showing you the Ival Court block. And then there's the location of the proposed development just to the left of those steps. And you could see that on the block plan. So the backdrop of the development is that building there, which we're all familiar with. And then we'll have a, another new block right in front of the Jackman's Community Centre proposed where I, where I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. And here's another photograph looking back towards Hadley from a similar location. Next slide, please. This one is, um, I just thought this would be of interest because this shows the 2008 proposal that was granted for a wider development scheme on this site. And you can see there was two blocks on either side of Ivor Court, one immediately in front of Ivor Court, the smaller block, and then the larger block is in the location of the proposal that we're talking about here. So you can see it was actually a similar arrangement that was approved back in 2008. Uh, albeit that development scheme did include some wider enhancement of the um, Ival Court area as well, and an, also an extension to the Ival Court block as well. So that was a wider redevelopment scheme, quite an ambitious scheme that was approved by the planning committee, but never went ahead because of the financial crash and it just didn't, it wasn't viable post 2008. And the next slide, please. And I wanted to show you this slide here, that top right elevation. That shows you the block in the same location of what you're being asked to determine today. So I wasn't able to get a, a montage to do the two combined because the, the applicant wasn't able to scale off the electronic plans. So what I've done there is just put that plan up there for you so you can see the scale of the building, not quite as high as what's proposed here, but it, it is it is wider and would have had a uh, arguably a greater material impact on the locality and the, the townscape than that proposed in the in this scheme now. So the purpose of that illustration there is just to show you what's been approved on this site before, albeit since 2008 planning policies have evolved, but I wouldn't think there's anything that's happened between 2008 and now that should lead to a different conclusion on development on this site of a quite a significant scale, given the wider townscape issues and the backdrop of Ival Court. So that's why I've showed you that. And it's, it's discussed in the report about the approval of this committee back in 2008. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I invite members to ask any questions now if they'd like to? Councillor Ian Mantle. Um, Mr. Ellis. Uh, well, other side, how much cycle storage is being provided and does it account for other kinds of vehicles other than bicycles? I'm thinking of things like push chairs, prams, um, mobility scooters and things like that. Uh, it is inside the block, as I mentioned earlier, and there's quite a significant space, but the detailed specifications of what actual facilities want to be within there are, aren't specified in the application. But if, if members are particularly concerned about that issue, that is something that we could condition to, I think the space is certainly large enough to accommodate 
extra provisions such as buggies and things like that um but uh i don't have that detail in front of me so if, if that's a particular concern we could certainly add a condition to uh require details of the exact specifications of the internal arrangements of the cycle storage and access to and from it um into the pedestrian area around the back if that's if members are minded to do that thank you Councillor Michael Muir, did you want to come back on that? Sorry. Councillor Michael Muir. Simon, was it Howard Cottage that bought this land? Uh, nobody bought it in the end, uh, Councillor Muir, because um, again, it was a similar arrangement to this one where it was an approved, there was, there was a resolution to grant and then following the resolution, the, the legal agreement was never completed because the company was McCann Homes, I think, and it was in partnership with North Hertfordshire Homes in my, my, my recollection, I'm going back a few years now. But, uh, and, and then I think what happened is McCann Homes went bust and then um, the scheme just sort of fell away. So, um, because you, you, you just needed to get too many flats on there to make it viable and as you can see, it was already quite a, quite a hefty development on, on the site. But no, I don't think it was Howard Cottage from, from my recollection. But is it Howard Cottage now that could buy? It? The because share, don't know. It's the, the applicant would be the, the purchaser and the applicant is not a housing, affordable housing provider. But I do understand they do have an affordable housing provider in mind for the shared ownership units, but they wouldn't be the owners of, 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 of the land. I asked that question because I was a board member of Howard Cottage and I Sorry, Chair, I thought you were talking about the, the 2008 scheme. Sorry. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we don't have anybody registered to speak on this item. So shall we move straight to the debate? Would anybody like to kick off or does anybody have anything they'd like to say? Councillor Ian Mantle. In the light of the previous comments, I would like to suggest that we do add the appropriate condition as suggested by Mr. Ellis. I hope that will meet with approval of the committee. And I had a further question. Um, what is the position regarding electric charging points, both internal for electric bicycles and uh, mobility scooters and externally for cars? um the latter point internal what you could do is incorporate that into the condition that you've already requested because that's about internal alterations uh, internal specifications of the of the internal facilities externally if you look at condition there's one towards the end yeah recommended by our air quality um officer it actually is quite uh, ambitious it's it's requiring ev charging points for 24 for each each flat so um that would have to be installed on the on the outside car parking area so we have a proposal to accept with conditions is that right i'm happy to propose with the addition of the condition as discussed Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Either Councillor Muir. Thank you, Councillor Muir. Shall we go to the vote then, please? Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Thank you. That concludes that item. Thank you very much. Um, and that's all the applications we have to consider this evening. Um, we move on to planning appeals. Simon, are you able to present the report? Yes, Chair, uh, no updates. I think uh, Sam mentioned the appeal that related to these item you earlier discussed, but no updates. I'll, I'll take any questions, thanks. Any questions for Simon? Thank you very much. That brings us to the close of the meeting then. Thank you.